<laughs> wow. Usually you walk in and there's like uh, you know a little backstage area. I was a little surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. The exchange rate and everything. There's no backstage. I see. Okay. I get it. Um, shouldn't we have an open border? I mean, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Let's not call it. Let's just open the stupid border. Come on. Maybe not, I don't know. Uh, I mean, bring it all up. Uh, yeah, it's dangerous. You know, we do that at work sometimes. You know, you'll bring up politics. You know how that is. You're at work, and all of a sudden you mention a president or a prime minister or something. Whoa, it's crazy. <laughs> or religion. Whoa, watch out for that. Uh, anyway, don't mean to start off Sunday so heavy. Let's. What's going on? You guys having fun? Yeah. yeah good. I haven't been here to Toronto in, I think someone told me, 12 years. I don't remember myself, I have no memory, but, um, yeah, I think I was here for Toronto Trek, like 12 yep. years. Yep. Is that, any of you here for that? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, cool. <laughs> me too, I think. <laughs> it was like at an airport hotel or something, right? Yep. Much smaller. This is unbelievable, this thing. This is crazy. I, I just was at Comic-Con in San Diego. Um, does anybody go to that? Anybody here go to Comic Con? Yeah. Wasn't it crazy? Yeah. Oh my God. This is so much better than Comic Con. Trust me, you guys don't need to go to San Diego. It, it really is, isn't it? This is like, you guys are civilized here. There's more than that. We're Canadian. You're Canadian. Everybody's friendly and nice. And you go to Comic Con, it's crazy. First of all, nobody knows where anything is happening. You just wander around, right? You just wander around. They're like, I don't know where that is. And then you spend the whole day waiting in lines. It was crazy. Lines after lines. And you, maybe you do one or two things all day. You know? Is that how it is here? It seems better here. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's the same. Yes. Very nice. Is it raining outside? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. We don't get rain in L.A., so I was actually kind of excited to see it. <laughs> I know, you guys are like, yeah, it's raining. I'm like, woohoo! No, we don't get the fires. Weather. Um, it was 112 Friday. Friday, Thursday or Friday. 112 in my car when I went to work. That's crazy, right? 112. What's that? Yeah, okay, that would be like, what? 41, 46. I just ask you guys questions. This is all... You think you're here to ask me questions, but I'm, it's all a trick. I'm turning around. So, uh, I don't know. I don't have a joke for um, So what else is going on? Anybody want to ask a question? That always helps me because I'm not very smart. Yes? Um, I was wondering what your fondest memory of Voyager was. My fondest memory of Voyager? <clears throat> um, I think... I mean, the first thing that jumps to mind is um, my trailer. See, there were, there were um, all the actors had their own little trailer, right? It's like a little camper. And um, it just so happened when they started the show that they put Kate Mulgrew's trailer and my trailer kind of at one end of the stage. And our doors, the front doors, faced each other. And then everyone else's trailer, for some reason, was down at the other end of the stage. So Kate and I were just kind of on our own. And um, one of my fondest memories was literally just the time sitting between shots, between filming, and Kate's door would be open, and my door would be open, and we'd be sitting in our trailers, like, a, like you're on a camp out or something, I guess, <laughs> and just talking, you know, and she, um, she'd be over there smoking and working on her character, <laughs> and, and, but we'd just talk about, she'd be reading a great book, or that's one of my fondest memories, is just kind of sitting there and hanging out with our trailer doors open and talking about a great movie we saw or a book we read or talking about the scene or, you know, talking about just life. We had a really good, a really great cast. Our cast was, we got along so well. Well, let me put it this way. The men got along so well <laughs> that, uh, that it was good. Uh, yeah, the ladies, on the other hand, there was always a little drama there. Um, kept us entertained. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, yeah. Yeah, there was a, yeah. 
That's usually how it is on shows, too. It's like the guys seem to, well, no, that's not true. No, I take that back. I worked on Las Vegas with James Caan. No, that's, that's um, yeah, it was, it was really, um, it was a lot of fun. Just that, that would be my fondest memory is hanging out with the rest of the cast because they were such interesting people. I think our show, we got lucky that they cast um, very different people. You know, it's like we weren't all the same kind of person. We all brought something very different to the work and to the character and, and just to the time we spent together. So um, one thing I love, I think says a lot about our cast, is that still, um, we've, we've been off the air, what, eight years or nine years, something like that. Um, we still, all the guys on the cast, <laughs> we get together. <laughs> yeah, no girls. We get together um, for like a steak dinner. It started at this restaurant called The Palm in, uh, in LA, and we got together for a steak dinner not long after the show went off the air, and it's just become this tradition. So every three or four months, you know, I'll get a call from Bob Picardo, and he'll say, yeah, we're organizing the boys' dinner, you know, we're gonna do it. And, and it's really great, you know, and so we, we have dinner at The Palm. I think we're gonna have dinner next month. And the guys are, we're all still very good friends. So, anyway, that was a long answer. <laughs> My answers will be very long this morning. Thank yes, you you're welcome. Yes, sir. Um, were you a fan of Star Trek before you uh, started doing Voyager? And also, um, you were a Wesley Crusher, and I know you were a Wesley Crusher. Right. Um, my father was a big fan of the original Star Trek. When I was young, he definitely loved science fiction. He used to read a lot of um, paperback science fiction novels. I remember stacks of them around the house. And um, To be honest, I remember the original series. I wasn't a huge fan. It wasn't that I was, I, I just didn't have a strong feeling about it, one way or the other. But my father's science fiction um, interest definitely led me to being a fan of the show Space 1999 oh, yeah. when I was a kid. Remember that show? Yeah, that was a show that I just, I loved watching that show. I would wait all week to watch it. And, um, and that was definitely something that inspired me when I became an actor. That was the kind of show I would have liked to have been on, you know, something with that kind of tone and, and writing and acting style. And so um, anyway, so that, that was one science fiction show that definitely influenced me. Um, when The Next Generation was on, I actually guest starred on, on an episode of The Next Gen, yeah. And I did, um, it was called, it was called First Duty, I think. And, um, and I played this character, Nick Locarno, who was kind of, uh, on the outside, looked like a good guy, but he was really not a good guy. He was kind of a troublemaker and got in a lot of trouble. Kind of like real life. And, uh, um, and uh, too much information. Inside voice, Robbie, inside voice. Um, so, um, yeah, so I did that, and, and even when I guest starred on the show, it's funny because I, um, when I got the offer to be on Next Generation, I actually had done a pilot for a new series called Going to Extremes, and the pilot was picked up, and so I kind of was um, just waiting to start this new series that I was very excited about. And um, my agent called and said, you know, the show Next Generation, it's a Star Trek show, they want you to come do a part for an episode. And I was like, well, I hadn't really watched it. And I said, I don't know much about it. Is, it. is it a good show? And my agent said, well, it's very popular. And my agent said every actor that, that she had known um, that did the Next Gen just had such an amazing time. Like, it's got a great reputation for people that, that do the show. They have such a good time. And I was like, all right. So I hadn't really, I didn't know much about it, but when I did it, she was absolutely right. Um, Will Wheaton and the other guest stars, the, the kids, the young people that were the Starfleet Academy uh, students, we had so much fun together. I mean, we'd, you know, we'd shoot all morning and then we'd keep our spacesuits on and we'd walk across the street and go have lunch together. Like, it was just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was kind of crazy when you think about it. But, but it was really fun. I mean, and I remember after doing the show, Will Wheaton would call me and say, how's your new series going? And, you know, and we, we stayed in touch. So it was great. Patrick Stewart was, was so generous and, and, and gracious in welcoming me to the show. 
I had a great time. So, so my long answer again, as I said, I, <laughs> you, um, I had a great time. And so when, cut to a few years later, when they said uh, this new show Voyager was starting up, and there was this character kind of like Nick Locarno, um, I was dying to do it because I knew how much fun it was to do that first, you know, the, the guest star part. And I really, um, they, they had said they were casting this role that was a lot like Nick Locarno, and they used my performance in Next Generation as kind of a, a reference for people auditioning. So I worked really hard to make sure they got the guy that did. <laughs> because it wasn't a guarantee, because they did write this character, but they were like, we're gonna look at other actors and make sure we like that character, but... So uh, yeah, I worked very hard. I was doing a play in New York City at the time, and I, I videotaped myself auditioning, and uh, I worked really hard, because I knew what a great opportunity was gonna be. So yeah, glad it worked out. Yes, sir? My favorite episode of Voyager, you know, a lot of people asked me that yesterday. Um, there were a lot, we did 170 episodes, I think. Um, there were a lot of great episodes. Some of the ones that jump out are uh, Someone to Watch Over Me, which was uh, the doctor teaching Seven of Nine how to go on a date. And uh, I don't know if you guys recall that episode. Yeah. 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 It, was a great, it was a really sweet episode. I directed that episode as well and, um, and had some, some nice scenes in it. Um, I love Parturition. Jonathan Frakes directed that episode. Jonathan's such a fun guy. Um, and, and Ethan Phillips and I were kind of teamed up for that story. And, and he and I remain really good friends. So, uh, so that was a lot of fun with Jonathan Frakes, Ethan Phillips, and myself just laughing for a week and a half. <laughs> being silly and playing with some robot chicken that was supposed to be a baby alien. And, and it was very silly. That was a lot of fun. Um, I like the pilot too. I loved working on the pilot episode. It was such, in terms of its size, and you know, we got to shoot in the middle of the salt flats in the desert, and all sorts of interesting locations. Um, and and the finale, I think those those were uh, some of the best episodes. Uh, yes, ma'am. What was your favorite moment directing? My favorite moment directing. I think when I got Kate Mulgrew to take her clothes off. <laughs> That would be my favorite. Um, yeah, she. That actually was my pitch. That was my. Uh, I'm not kidding. That was my. Because, I, and, and I don't mean to sound like a pervert, but. Uh, but the truth was, as I as I read the script, and I thought, you know, this is some an unusual opportunity to see the captain of a of a Starfleet ship in a very vulnerable position, and she was kind of offering herself to go through this this kind of. Um, training or whatever, this kind of, uh, you know, religious training. And I just thought, what's more vulnerable, what's more, you know, vulnerable than, than actually seeing that she has to take her, her, take her Starfleet uniform off and get her body painted, and I thought it could be sexy, and it could be vulnerable, and it could be really different. Um, I think there was an episode of Next Gen where Patrick Stewart took his clothes off, wasn't there? Yeah. yeah. There's two of them. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying I... How embarrassing. No, but you know what my point is. Darn it. My point is, is like when you see Patrick Stewart, you know, being tortured or whatever, and you see that image, you know, as a director, uh, as, a, as a, you know, as a creative person, that's a way to tell the story. So that, that was... Uh, one of my favorite memories is getting Kate Mulgrew naked. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what did you think of the writing overall? And second question, if you think of the writing overall? And second question is, as an actor, would you have been interested in playing any other character in the Voyager series? Um, what did I think of the writing overall? Uh, the, the writing, you know, there's, there's wonderful qualities about the Star Trek writing, which is incredibly... Um, creative and intelligent storytelling. There's um, taking these kind of very heightened metaphors and, 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 and telling stories with great meaning. That part of the writing I loved, and when the writers did that, it was, it was wonderful. You felt like you were doing something important and something that was going to last for a long, long time. The other part of the writing that was always frustrating 
is that sometimes they'd write in a language that didn't feel like people, you know? It was like, it was a little stiff sometimes. And, and so I remember when I first got on the pilot of, uh, of Voyager, they had written this character who was very angry and, you know, rebellious or whatever that means. And, and I just thought, you know, this is going to get old, like playing a character who doesn't, you know, this character didn't speak like a normal person. So I started kind of throwing in little comments improvising, if you will, which was not really welcome. They didn't like us to improvise on Star Trek. They didn't like, you know, they just wanted it as scripted, period. But um, I think that kind of gave them some ideas of how to write the character, honestly, and we started evolving the character together. And so I always loved it when my character, at least, spoke like a real human being and kind of made jokes or sarcastic comments or, you know, um, that part of it, I, I feel like, um, came from a, from kind of a collaboration with the writers and kind of seeing who I was and 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 what the character could be that was a little more than just this um, anti-establishment rebel kind of guy. So, um, but we had some great writers. Brian Fuller, who a lot of you know from Heroes or Pushing Daisies or Dead Like Me, started as a entry level writer on our show. And um, yeah, we have we have some. Very talented writers. So, thank Whoa, you. Lots of hands. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I know there's a lot of Voyager fanfic online, and I was just wondering, um, some of it's more interesting than others. Interest. Not interesting. Interesting. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> have you read any, and what did you think of it? Um, yeah, I think it's really cool that there's um, fans out there that kind of create this parallel world to to what the the studio produces and and, and uh, writes. Um, I haven't read it in a long time. There was a time in the middle, <clears throat> excuse me, somewhere in the middle of shooting Voyager where I was able to go to more conventions and kind of see the fans a little more and I had a very active fan club and I, and I have to admit, at that time I did read some of the fan fiction and, and see a lot of it. There was some great writing in the fan fiction. There's definitely some stuff that would not be, you know, for the family audience. <laughs> Uh, which, uh, which was very interesting. I have some copies in my... Uh, um, no, it was cool. It was cool because that, it, it's kind of what, uh, what I was saying about the writers and my thoughts about the writers. Sometimes I wish the writers and the studio had pushed things a little more in the way that the fans and the fan fiction do. I mean, you know, there's limits and there's, there's uh, taste and things like that. <laughs> But I think that it's it's really interesting in that in that parallel kind of world of fan fiction or or now fan produced you know episodes and things like that that um, you know that they're pushing the limits and of of what these characters in the franchise can do. So I think it's cool. I think it's great. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, one of my particular two favorites in the Voyager are Fairhaven and most particularly the uh, Captain Proton. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which ones did you like best, Fairhaven or Captain Proton? I love Captain Proton. Did you guys hear yeah. what she said? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Um, yeah, she was talking about the holodeck programs and how much fun they were. Yeah, I loved the holodeck. Um, and I love Captain Proton. I thought that was really cool. I wish we had done more of that. Um, the writers were feeling, when we did it, like, like they felt like we did it really well and they didn't want to just continue it until it, you know, became old or bad, poorly done. So, so we only did those few episodes that involved it. But I thought it was great. I thought that was such the perfect way to kind of poke fun at what we do you know, and the kind of show we were making by using this old black and white, you know, Flash Gordon style thing. It was really fun and, and uh, yeah, it was great. And then some of the, the guest stars that we had playing, you know, Dr. Chaotica or, or his, you know, henchmen, it was just hilarious to watch these character actors just chewing the scenery and just being so silly. Bring Janeway in, yes, trying to coach her on how this all works. and um, Yeah, it was very fun. I, I really enjoyed it. I think it was fun for the designers, too, because our, our set designers and everyone could really have fun with this old, 
you know, nostalgic kind of sci-fi show. So, yeah, it was fun. There's a quick story. Sorry, no hands are going up. Quick story about <laughs> one of my long stories about Captain Proton. Um, you know, there was one scene where I was uh, in the holodeck flying through space with a jetpack, and uh, and I was talking in my secret, super secret watch to Harry Kim, I think, or something, and. So they had written this scene, and, and the way we were going to do this was they built like a big teeter-totter, you know, um, thing to lift me up that I'd lie down in. It was for green screen, and it was a green teeter-totter, and it would lift me up about 20 feet in the air in front of a big green screen. And then I had my costume with the jetpacks, and the jetpacks were actually like big sparklers, you know, they'd flip a, a switch, and it was like a, a little, um, kind of like fireworks would come out of the back. But they had assured me, they said, you know, we've, you know, fireproofed all of your clothes. And, and, and it's really, when the sparklers come out, it's just like a sparkler. Like, it, you know, you could hit your hand and it wouldn't burn. It was, it's going to be fine. <laughs> so, uh, so we're doing this and they hoist me up 20, 30 feet in the air in front of the green screen. I'm strapped in. I'm locked into this thing. And... And then they start, roll camera, okay, we're rolling, and okay, three, two, one, action. They flip the switch and off go the sparklers, and, and I talk into my watch like I'm, you know, I'm flying like this. And we get through the dialogue, and the director says, okay, keep going, let's go back to it one more time. And so I start the scene over again, and just as I started for the second time, I feel my pants are getting warm. And, uh, like a sparkler might get warm if you continue to sparkle. And, uh, so, so I do a few more lines, and, it, and in a second, in like a moment, it went from, wow, my pants are warm, to, oh my god, my butt's on fire. And I started screaming and yelling, and they, and, and, and they see that my butt is on fire, my pants are on fire. And they bring me down, and they bring a fire extinguisher, and, a, and it's, you know, how humiliating. <laughs> you know, strapped into a seesaw with your butt on fire. It's not a very heroic thing. Um, and then the nurse had to, you know, our, our paramedic had to come over and check my butt cheeks. <laughs> it was, it's not as glamorous as you would imagine. So, so maybe I don't like Captain Proton. <laughs> Um, now I'm changing my mind. Um, anyway, there were some questions. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Robbie. How are you? And Good. I'm Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. I have a question that is non-Voyager. Okay. What was your experience like directing Supernatural, Skin, and did you manage to escape any of the pranks that the boys were doing? Yeah, I directed in the first season. Thank you very much. They directed in the first season of Supernatural. Um, it was one of the woo. Was the woo, woo, woo. Um, I directed one of the first. I think it was maybe the fifth episode or something. I can't recall. It was very early, and the reason I remember it was early is because um, they were trying to. You know, whenever a new show starts out. It's hard to know what that show's going to be, if it's going to be as funny as you want, or as scary as you want, or, or if you're going to be able to make it for the budget that the studio gives you, all these things, you don't know. You kind of go into it with a plan. So Supernatural had gone into it with a plan to, um, they wanted to have a scary story every week. They wanted it to be really scary. But because it was on the, the WB, I think, at the time, they, they knew that they wanted these young guys, Jared and Jensen, to, um, to uh, be funny and charming. So they kind of wanted a, a little light comedy banter with a scary monster of the week. And they wanted to do all that in eight days. And, um, and they hadn't been able to do that yet. When I came to direct, I think the first few episodes had taken 13 days to film, you know, which is way over budget, to be quite honest. <laughs> they had been way over budget. They would not been that funny. They felt like you know, with a banter. They felt like some of their monsters weren't really scary, so they said, you have to do it in eight days. They kind of put the hammer down on me. And you've got to give us all this stuff. So I felt a lot of pressure, because no one else had been able to do it. 
But we did it. We did it in eight days. We shot that episode in eight days, on time and on budget, the first one to do that. And, um, and with this whole shapeshifter thing, um, you know, it hadn't been written exactly uh, all the details of that, but one of the things I added was the whole peeling the skin off and, you know, um, and seeing this, this monster sort of transform in one scene. And, um, and I think it was a really powerful image, you know, kind of going back to the Kate Mulgrew taking her clothes off. I mean, you know, sometimes there's a, as a director, that's why I love directing is because, you know, writers will think of a story and it's all very theoretical and until you actually know, until you actually do it, you don't know if it's going to work. Um, and so as a director, I get to think of these things and imagine these things and, and do them like, like a monster peeling his skin off. And, um, it was much more exciting to see Jensen do it for me than to see Kate. <laughs> yes, yes, I understand. <laughs> well, we got to give everybody a little something, you know. <laughs> Us boys need something too. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that, that was kind of my experience, is I felt like I had really accomplished something in a series that was just beginning. We, yeah, it was a very good episode, a good emotional episode, um, scary monster, fun with the boys, they, they had some good banter, and we did it on budget, which you know, means that I get to work again. <laughs> because if I don't do it on budget, then they don't hire me anymore, so. Um, Oh, wow, that's very nice. Thank you. Yay. Yeah, I had, um, I had worked with Jensen that year before on Dawson's Creek. He had been a, a recurring character on Dawson's Creek. So it was funny because I'd done the last season of Dawson's Creek, worked with Jensen a lot, got along with him great, and then uh, started off the next season at Supernatural with, with Jensen. So that helped me a lot. Just, you know, I think that was one of the reasons I could help get some of that banter and the fun out of the boys that maybe other people had not found at that point was, I knew Jensen already, we had a relationship. So, so, um, so yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to do that show. How many years has that been on now, six? Four. Going, into five. Oh. Going, into five. Going into five, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's great, that's great. Good for them. Did they pull, you know, it was so early, again, going back to, it, everybody was trying to figure out, are we gonna be able to do this show, so, they were pretty much, I mean, they were fun. Both of them were great. Um, but no, I think at that point in the series, they were kind of focused on just hanging on and f hopefully surviving. I'm sure now they are a lot of trouble, a big <laughs> handful for their directors. Yeah. Um, let me go way back. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, we had a lot of practical jokers. I mean, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is um, J Ethan Phillips and <laughs> Ethan Phillips and Tim Russ had an ongoing battle of uh, gastric excrementing. Uh, <laughs> Ethan and Tim basically had a fart war <laughs> going on. Every show's got a fart war somewhere there. Anyway, Tim and, e and Ethan had a fart war, and I do remember there was one scene in the mess hall where, and I hate to, you know, this, if this offends anyone, I'm sorry, but Ethan Phillips let loose the nastiest, foulest fart I have ever experienced in my life. It was a full anomaly. <laughs> and, uh, and it was in the middle of a mess hall scene with a lot of extras. So there were a lot of people there. And after he farted, he made such a big deal about Tim, blaming it on Tim. <laughs> and he, he was so convincing and committed. And, and then people started jumping on the bandwagon. Of course I did too. I was like, this is fun, let's blame it on Tim. <laughs> so poor Tim, it was like the whole, you know, 100 extras or whatever it was. Everyone believed that Tim Russ had really laid that bomb. When, <laughs> when it wasn't at all, it was Ethan Phillips. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty funny. We had a lot of practical jokers. We had, um, you know, one thing that I remember doing, I, I had a cold one time, and we were filming a, a break, um, um, a briefing room scene, and um, and I had this cold, everybody kind of knew it, because I was kind of stuffy and sneezing a little bit, and I'd gone into the makeup trailer, the 
you know, get some makeup, I guess, or something. And I noticed oh, with all the prosthetics that we have there, the, the glue jars had dried glue that looked like snot. And I thought, well, that, that could be fun. So, so I like told Scott, our makeup guy, I said, let me just peel off a big, like, dried up piece of that clear glue that you've got there. And I'm going to wait for everybody to get in the break or in the briefing room. And I'm going to stick that right out, coming out of my nose. And I'm going to run in like last minute, like, you know, sorry. So, yeah, so I did that. So I stuck that there with some, and we added some yellow, you know, we, just, we really built it up. And I made sure everybody was in the break room. And then I, I came running in late. I'm like, oh, guys, I'm sorry. I'm so, I just, you know, I've been had this cold, so I'm running a little late. Sorry, let's go. And I just pretended like I didn't know. And it was, it was so disgusting that no one wanted to be the one to say, you've got a giant snot bomb hanging out of your thing. So, yeah, it was quite funny. So finally, Kate Mulgrew came over with a tissue and she kind of handed it to me. And I went, and I blew my nose. I was like, oh my god! It was funny. It was funny. You know, stuff like that. It's very immature. Yes, sir. What's it like working on Chuck? Thank you, yes. Okay. Yeah, I've been producing and directing a show called Chuck, which is uh, in the States on NBC, and I think up here it's on City TV. It's right here. Yeah. Um, Chuck is great. I mean, Chuck is um, kind of a dream show for somebody like me, because I really enjoy comedy, although I know Voyager was not a comedy, but. I've always enjoyed a set that is uh, funny, as you can tell, funny, and 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 um, and so Chuck is a great hybrid show. We've got we've got great comic writing, great comic actors with our nerd herd and buy more staff. Um, Zach Levi is is uh, an amazing uh, leading actor in our show. Um, so I got the comedy and the and the quirky characters, and then also we we have great. Emotion with the Chuck and Sarah love story and and uh, great writing there and then and then to top it all off I get to blow things up and shoot lots of guns so you know it's a dream show for for somebody like me it's it's it reminds me Chuck for those of you who haven't seen it, it reminds me of a the kind of classic Hollywood blockbuster action comedies like Lethal Weapons or Die Hard or you know the ones with great action and funny you know memorable comic sequences, and uh, it's just great. It's really fun. So, I love it. I love it, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am? Um, just sort of leading into that, like we watch a lot of shows and we keep seeing your name popping up on all sorts of different episodes. I think yeah, CSI. Um, really? I didn't do CSI. No, okay. no, but that's cool. I hope I get a residual. <laughs> 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 I remember all the ones, because we keep seeing your, oh, hey, it's Robert. I'm yeah, Robert. yeah. Now, what led you to go more towards that end of the spectrum as opposed to... I, now like I behind the scenenes yeah, as opposed to... Yeah, I don't know if you're to. doing plays or anything like that, but we haven't right. seen you as much in front of the screen. Yeah, I haven't like, acted since 2001, honestly. I'm, so what led you to go that route? Um, I, you know, it's, it's probably a very complicated answer and also very simple. Um, the simple version is it's much more reliable to be behind the scenes. I can have a longer career. You know, I saw a lot of my friends and, and very talented people that I knew um, doing great acting work and then having trouble getting a job and I just was I, I wanted to work so so on the simple side that's probably the simple answer and the one that's a little more complicated is the truth is even though I started acting when I was young and even though I'm standing in front of you guys talking I'm actually a very shy person I'm not really um, a outgoing. I never really liked being uh, famous. I mean, honestly, I didn't. That was not something I set out to do. And and often I'd get really uncomfortable, like you know, almost embarrassed. Like, um, you know, yeah, I'm an actor, whatever. You know, I. So I, I think it was more comfortable for me when I started directing. I was like, oh, I'm not. I don't have to be the center of attention. I don't have to be in front of a camera with people put makeup on my face and worrying about a zit or a, you know, snot coming out of my head. <laughs> um, but that's probably, you know, in terms of more 
the real answer is it was just more comfortable for me to, to direct and produce. And I love being creative and working with great actors. And I love working with actors who really love being in front of the camera. I was never really comfortable, to be quite honest. I like doing theater, that's where I started. Um, there was something about doing a play that you could kind of hide behind the lights and, and this anonymous crowd that you didn't know anybody and yeah, just do we're, we're both actors from yeah. Ottawa, so yeah, we totally know that. Yeah, so there's something about doing a play and, and, and when you when I did a play as an actor, you could tell the story beginning to end. You know, you, you start the play and the story goes along and you finish and you're done. Whereas when you're filming as an actor, you might start on the first day of, a, of an episode, let's say, and you're shooting the last scene. And you shoot that in the very first day, and you're like, well, I'm not sure how I'm going to feel, because we haven't done the story yet. But So it's very hard sometimes as an actor to kind of figure that out, and it all feels very disjointed. And, and uh, yeah, as a director, I can kind of plan and take my time to, to learn about what the story is and figure out my shots and how what the emotional arcs are and what's, you know, all that. So. Yeah, that's that's kind of the answer. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, yes, ma'am. What are your current projects at this point? That you're My current projects, um, I'm really pretty immersed in Chuck, and I've been doing that for this is the third season. I just finished um, editing the season premiere just two days ago. So um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and it's really exciting. And for those of you that watch Chuck or know it, you know, um, our, the guy that created the show, Chris Vidak, probably put it the best um, when I heard him say this year that Chuck is really about the birth of a superhero. That's what the whole show is really about. So the first season was about Chuck um, having this computer in his head and, and, uh, and, and being really confused and overwhelmed. And, uh, and the second season was about him kind of going you know what, I just want to be a regular guy, I don't want to be a superhero, he was in the denial phase. And this season um, is really about Chuck going, wait a minute, this is kind of cool, maybe I do want to be a spy, yes, I do want to be a superhero. So, so we, it's really been an interesting uh, project to, to, to be involved with because it's not just one concept that keeps repeating itself every week, it's, it's a real evolution, every, every season's been a a very different kind of uh, chapter in the birth of a superhero. So, so that's what I'm doing right now, and then uh, that's really it. I'm pretty much immersed in that, and hopefully we'll survive another season and come back for a fourth season. Or uh, um, it's also a time after three seasons where I may be doing some development of, of new shows. I did a show called Samantha Who, which was a comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, I did the show, the pilot for Samantha Who, and uh, that was right before Chuck, and so I was able to be in the ground floor of that show and help bring Christina Applegate, and, and Tim Russ was on the show. Yep. And I put, yeah, I put Tim Russ in the pilot, and that show lasted two years. So um, that's something that I really enjoy doing is starting shows from the beginning and working with the writers or studios to to figure out what you know, what might be the next big thing. So um, so I'll do some of that. I don't know exactly what it is right now because it's not that time of year, but probably in, in the winter I'll be working on some pilot of some sort, I hope. As long as I stay on budget, then I get to work again. See, that's the theme. Yes, way back there. Uh, right there, yeah. Yeah. As a director, who do I like to collaborate? Who would I like to collaborate with? Um, that's a good question. You know, there's a show coming out called Glee. Have you guys seen this? Anybody? Yeah. Um, just on a personal note, I started as a you know in high school doing things like Glee Club and you know community theater and musicals and all that stuff. So when I saw this show, Glee, and sh um, I think his name is Ryan Murphy, that created that show. He created a show called Nip Tuck, and he wrote and directed a movie called Running With Scissors that I thought was really interesting. And um, anyway, I would love to work with Ryan Murphy. I'd love to work on Glee. That would be a fun show, because you, know, you get to sing and dance. And, uh, and it's kind of about nerds and misfits and odd people that don't feel like they fit in, which I think like on Chuck is a part of Chuck that I really enjoy doing. So, 
Yeah, Ryan Murphy would be cool. Um, um, who else? I don't know. I liked working with Brian Fuller. You know, I did um, the show Dead Like Me. I directed some of those episodes of Brian Fuller's show. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed Dead Like Me. Um, I think Brian's incredibly creative. I'd love to work with him again. Um, I like the guys I work with right now a lot. Josh Schwartz, you know, he comes from the OC, um, which was a classic kind of, you know, teen soapy show, but he's a much more interesting person than just that side of him. And Josh is great, you know, he, uh, he's got Chuck on the air now, Gossip Girl, he's, uh, he's writing, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I think he's writing the next X-Men movie. Um, so Josh is a really good, is that true? Do you guys know that? Yeah, yeah, I think he is. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about that. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Um, but, but yeah, Josh is pretty cool, and, and he's really cool and very creative, and I love collaborating with him. So, And I also just like working with um, nice people. I know that sounds a little cheesy, but at this point, it's like in, in my life, I just like working around. We spend so much time, you know, I... I practically live at the studio or on a set when I'm producing and directing, so I want to be around people that, that I don't hate. <laughs> so, um, so right now, I got a lot of nice people around, and so it's, that's good, so, yeah. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah. I was wondering how much of Paris is in you. Do you have any interesting classic cars brought in Roland? Yeah, he, he asked um, how much of Tom Paris is in me. Um, yeah, like the car thing, the kind of nostalgic old muscle car buff thing. Uh, yeah, I um, I think some of that, like I was saying before, I think it, it, it was kind of a, a collaboration, all those things. The, the, the idea that Tom Paris liked old muscle cars, actually when we were doing Star Trek at that time, I had some, I was into motorcycles, I rode motorcycles, and I had an old Harley, I had a 1970s Ducati uh, Cafe Racer, I had a bunch of bikes, and I used to ride a lot, and so I think the... Um, the writers knew that about me, and so they started saying, oh, well, what if, you know, Tom Paris was into those similar things? So it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, they, they wrote muscle cars on the show, but I had the motorcycles at home in a very similar kind of way. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of, of Tom Paris and me. But similarity with Sir who wrote music and they made him a writer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, you know, he's not just an alcoholic. He's, uh, he's, he's an interesting guy. He had some babes, actually, uh, you know. As well, cool that Rush was the key to solving. <laughs> exactly. Isn't Rush the key to everything, though, in life? It all comes back to Rush music. <laughs> as well, yeah, you don't want to let go of the lovable alcoholic that's Jeff. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to see more. Uh, definitely one thing that's going to happen this season, um, it, partially due to budget cuts and the economy and the way life is, uh, you know, we were presented with a problem of some budget cuts. So how do we do that? Well, maybe we can't see the entire cast in every single episode. But what that's actually led us to is, all right, to solve the budget problem, we we don't have everybody in every episode, but that means we write a little deeper for each character. So if Jeff and Lester are in an episode, they're gonna have a little bit more to do, or if Morgan's in an episode, he may not just be in the buy more, we might see him involved in Chuck's spy life a little bit. So there's gonna be, it's this economic situation for season three kind of led us to some interesting ideas. And so, um, so yeah, it's gonna be, you're gonna see a lot more of those guys, um, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the similarities between Paris and Locarno. Yeah. Why didn't they just spin off the Locarno character onto Voyager? Right. Um, well, yeah, they had um, they had really liked that character Locarno, and they had liked um, the performance that I had given, and so they were thinking of bringing that that specific character onto Voyager. The problem is with the writers union, the writers guild. Um, the writer that wrote that episode with Nick Locarno then would be 
a creator of a new series, and it kind of got into residuals and and ownership and all that. So they they basically just said, all right. We'll basically put Nick Locarno on the show. We'll just call him somebody else. We'll, we'll rename him, and then we don't have to pay the writer. Um, it's kind of, that's what the reality was. We all wonder why there was a writer's strike? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it was, uh, a lot of it had to do, is that a Wienerlicious outfit back there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Wienerlicious girl, that's hilarious. Say hi, wait a minute. It's Chuck and, Chuck and Sarah, that's so funny. <laughs> I've never seen anybody dressed as Chuck and Sarah. <laughs> yes, you can, that's hilarious. I have to get a picture and take it back to work tomorrow. That's <laughs> that's so funny. They're gonna die. <laughs> Sorry. I was just sitting with Ivan Strahovski, who plays um, uh, Sarah on our show, and it was Friday night. They were filming quite late, and I was about to head to the airport. And I was talking with Ivan and telling her I was going to do. You know, these, the actors on my show they forget sometimes that I was even an actor. And, um, <laughs> kind of like my children, like my youngest son, he doesn't even believe I ever was an actor. He just doesn't. Um, but I was talking to Yvonne, and she's like, she's like, oh yeah, I forgot you're you were a Star Trek guy. You're going to this thing. She and she was asking me all these questions. Like she's dying to come do conventions. She's done you know a couple appearances and. Uh, so I'm sure that those, you know, Zach and Yvonne and, and all those guys, Vic and Scott, they'll be out here soon. Vic and Scott actually performed at Comic-Con as Jeffster, for those Chuck fans. They got up on stage as Jeffster, their little pseudo band, and uh, performed at Comic-Con. Uh, Fat Bottom Girls, the Queen song. You know, what, what, what else would you expect them to sing? Maybe Wilson Phillips or... Uh, Duran Duran, I don't know. Um, cool, that's funny. Sorry. Yes? Hi. I loved your work on all my children. Oh, wow, you're really going deep. Handsome young actor, but was there a certain project that took you to the West Coast? Um, when I was on All My Children, uh, many, many years ago, 1923, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I was a younger actor, and, and uh, it, it's funny, um, that reminds me of my conversation with Yvonne. You know, uh, when I was on All My Children, I, I felt like, I've got to go do movies. I've got to, you know, I should be doing bigger, more important things. And um, there's a real danger for actors in particular to um, be on a show and have some success and think that that it's only gonna get better and better, and sometimes the show you're on is the best it's ever gonna be. And I, and I try to remind people of that sometimes, like just be where you are, you know? If you're on Chuck, be on Chuck. If you're on Star Trek Voyager, just be there. And it took me a long time to appreciate that. But um, yeah, when I was on All My Children, I was anxious to go, you know, do bigger things. So I, um, I, uh, I had done a movie in the middle of, of being on All My Children. I did a movie called Masters of the Universe. <laughs> the Key Man story. Somebody's got a copy right there, very funny. <laughs> Please do not show that to everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I did this movie in the middle of, uh, between my second and third year on All My Children, and, um, and I had kind of flown back and forth. I was doing double duty, so I literally sometimes would would shoot the soap opera in the day, jump on a plane, and then get off and go to shoot all night. We shot a lot of night work on Masters of the Universe, and um, it was the 80s, you know, there was a lot going on back then. Uh, <laughs> we'll skip that part of the story. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I did, I did that movie, and um, there wasn't anything in particular that I left for, to be quite honest. I just knew that if I didn't get off the soap opera, I wouldn't be available to do anything else really. It was very hard when I did masters to, to try to do two things at once. So when I left all my children, I went back to the theater, actually it was the first job I did, um, the first national tour of Into the Woods, the Stephen Sondheim musical. Yeah! Yeah baby! Musical theater! Yeah! Uh, yeah! Yeah, I did a 
did a lot of musicals. Yeah, I did. Um, I actually worked with Stephen Sondheim three times, so um, that was really quite cool. Uh, yeah, I did a lot of musicals, and uh, I did did that. What else did I do? I don't know. I did different stuff. I did a play called Six Degrees of Separation on Broadway, which was uh, a really cool play uh, based on a true story about a guy that impersonated Sidney Poitier's son, and he went around to all the rich people of New York City and basically scammed them all. And it was a great, really exciting play to do. It was one of those plays in New York on Broadway that season that it seemed like there was an article in the New York Times about it every day, and it was just, it was like the hot play to be involved in. So, so yeah, I feel really lucky that uh, I've done so many different things, you know, um, and I've really done maybe not a ton of movies and not a ton of TV shows, but I've, I've gotten to do like, a little bit of everything I ever wanted to do, you know, so uh, I feel very lucky that way. Uh, that's mine. Five more minutes. Okay, five more minutes. I can squeeze some in. Yes, sir? Uh, how much of the technical battle did you understand for your and how long did it take you to get used to it? The techno battle, yes. I, that was a tough one. I, um, I was never very good at it, to be honest. If you see on the show, when I'm looking down at my console pretending to drive, I was often reading the techno battle. <laughs> and you know what else is funny? It took me like two seasons to, to realize that Tim Russ and Robert Beltran and Garrett Wong had been doing that from the beginning. <laughs> and for some reason, I'm sitting down front and it didn't occur to me that I could write down all that really hard techno babble. So for two years I struggled, and the first, my first attempt was to go, all right, well let me break it down in a way like if it were a car or a motorcycle en engine or something, like what would I be, you know, kind of substitute what I was trying to talk about to make sense of it for myself. But then I, then I discovered that I could write it down and just read it, and it was great. Um, no, it was very hard, that stuff. And, and you know, and the idea is that it should sound normal, and you should just be able to just spit it out without a problem, but uh, no, I never, they, that's why they wrote things for me like, yes ma'am, <laughs> I could handle that. <laughs> Anything more than yes ma'am, uh, I started to get into trouble. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yes sir. Uh, as an actor turned director yourself, what do you think it is about the Star Trek system that they seem to have so much success in taking really good actors and turning them into even better directors? Wow. Um, well, thank you on all those comments. Uh, uh, even after my story of yes, ma'am, you still say I was a really good actor. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's do it. Exactly. Um, yeah. I I don't know what it is. I think that there was always kind of a classic style to Star Trek in its storytelling, in its um, filmmaking style. There was something just classic and fundamental so that you could learn kind of just those basic storytelling lessons that then you could take into a more contemporary series or movie and, and, and you knew the fundamentals. You know, that's, that's the thing that I really appreciate now is a lot of directors or actors that I know, they come with maybe a style or experience of some new, hip, cool style of editing or directing. But if you don't know the fundamentals, if you don't know what the rules are that you're breaking, then you don't, you aren't really doing the best work you can do. So I really, on Star Trek, we would have week to week, maybe one episode would be a romantic comedy, the next week would be an action adventure, the next week would be a, you know, a thriller. We got to play with style, you know, genres and styles within Star Trek. We got to learn classic filmmaking techniques and storytelling techniques. So. Um, so I feel really well prepared to do pretty much anything, and uh, and it's it's been great. So, yeah. Last question, all the way in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I think Chuck is currently the best show on television. Woo! <laughs> I will tell her that. I will tell her that. Uh, yeah, your Scott Bakula question was, uh, is he going to come back on the show? I, I hope so. Uh, he's got a series, I think it's a comedy on TEBS or some cable network with um, Ray Romano, 
Scott Bakula and Andre Brower. So if he's not available to us right now, we loved having him on the show. He's a great, he's a great human being, first of all, so I love working with him, but he's, he's a perfect actor for the, for the Chuck world. And uh, I hope so. I mean, we've got 13 episodes that we're, we've figured out right now, and we know what that story is that we're telling, and, and that's a really exciting and a new kind of story for Chuck. It's definitely stepping up the, uh, the mythology of the show. But after that, I think there's absolutely an opportunity to bring him back, and maybe he'll be available to us. So. Well, thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure.